Welcome to the Museum of FIT's Fashion Culture Online series. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs. It is my honor to introduce your Wayne-born fashion designer, Gabriela Hurst, who is the winner of the 2016-17 International Walmart Prize for Women's Wear and the 2020 CFDA American Women's Wear Designer of the Year Award, among others. In December of 2020, Hearst was appointed the new creative director for Chloe. She will speak in conversation with MFIT director and chief curator, Dr. Valerie Steele. Enjoy the show. I thought I'd begin by asking you about the arc of your life and career. Um, you were born in Uruguay in Latin America and how has that influenced your life and work? I think it's, it's basically the root and the source of everything I do and how I move myself in the world um, as a professional and, a, and as a human being, because you learn so much when you grow up in such a remote place. And, um, and also you're well rooted because your family's been there for a long time. My mom still lives there um, and uh, it's going to be 170 years my family's there. It's already been actually. And she still lives off the grid and she still carries herself with those those values that I was brought up with. And and I learned there the basically the two the two columns where we build the Gavilla Hurston, which is long term view on sustainability. So is everything I am. And I always like this quote that somebody said, which was, you can take the girl out of the country, but not the country out of the girl. And I always feel that, you know, at, at the heart of everything, even if I've been living in New York City for 21 years, I'm still a farm girl. Beautiful. And this is your mother on the horse. A yeah. picture of her. Wow, yeah. that's gorgeous. She was 19 years old. And this was a period of her life where she was um, competing in rodeo. And she was the, this is in, in now her ranch and that time my grandfather's ranch. And she was competing in rodeo, the only female competing in rodeo in a, in a men's arena. So she really was from a very young age showing me that the world for a woman wasn't as limited, right? So I grew up really with a certain matriarchy forces behind me. And the picture of me as a little kid, which is also in the ranch, I basically, I was probably that age or maybe a year older where I have one of my first memories, which is my mom being thrown by a horse and hitting the ground and then blood coming out of her mouth, her teeth falling and walking towards me like nothing had happened. And I had this conversation with her recently where I was like, you know, do you remember this, da, 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 da. And she remembered the horse. And she's like, how do you remember? I'm like, cause it was traumatic mom. Mm. But the, the thing is, is that there was so much strength and courage, right? And I feel that that's always the type of um, woman that I'm, inspired by because they have this bravado but at the same time they have an emotional fragility that this bravado is 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 it's hiding in a way so it always intrigued me um that type of um projection right this androgyny androgyny yeah. is, the, is the right word that i'm looking for is this androgyny that you can be both right and what were you like as a child you know, it's it's very, I was very, like every child, very molded by my background and the same as everyone. We all think that whatever circumstances we brought up is the normal, right? But it took me a long time till my husband told me, you know, it's not normal. <laughs> it's, and, it, and for me, it was, you know, growing up in a place with hundreds of horses and a really long, long landscapes, I mean, large uh, uh, pieces of land where you only are confronted with with nature. And so I think it really 
form my brain to because there was not a lot of the disruptions that kids have today like in, in Uruguay even if I was born in 1976 it was quite conservative and obviously this was pre-globalization so the only thing in the ranch was radio and books and magazines and your imagination so my imagination was really my my toy yes and That's so cool. that that is really how it shaped me so are you the little girl or the baby here I'm the baby <laughs> and that's my father and my mom. And what I love about this picture and there's everything you see is there's always a handmade element where first of all, there's a lot of gauchos in the background, which is was like obviously the normal for me, yes. but I love how gauchos dress. I, I, um, and my mom is wearing this knitted sweater that it's made from the wool of the farm. And you can see the black sheep and the white and the, and it's it's not dyed it's it's just knitted and i i just love the colors too and it's very much um a place where i've always take my aesthetics from yes let's look at the next one because i think that shows it too even more that's actually my foreman sebastian and myself in my ranch which i inherited from my father's ranch and sebastian was it's, it's kind of a brother to me in the sense that he went to work with my father when he was 18. So my father raised him in a way, uh, in his professional way and his value system. So we're, we're very close and, um, and I, and I uh, it's, it's kind of having my father's thinking still alive. That's nice. How would you describe the Gabriella Hurst style? I always try to achieve a sort of uh, timeless in the way um, I do things. I'm not very trend based. And sometimes it happens that I hit trends, but it's just because I feel like I live in New York and for 21 years and you're so just, I walk New York every day or or really I try to do a big long walk in New York a week right and different parts of New York at all times in different periods because you you feel the subconscious it's one of my favorite things like headphones with music in my ears and and just perceiving New York right from from the side of your eye and and there's always feeding you and and so I think that that is also the part that influenced my design and and so I'm mixing these two worlds, the rural and the urban. And I've always feel like what an extreme right I grew up in the middle of nowhere and I live in New York. And I think that I came especially during COVID I came to the conclusion because I've I've lived here for September 11 the blackout 2008. And. Um, and last year, and I never left. And I think that what it is that I feel in both places is a grit, right? There's yeah. a grit to New York and there's a grit to living in the country. And so I think within what I designed, there's also a grit um, because the, the pieces have to last. So yeah. there's a lot of research in order to have these pieces well-made, which is the most sustainable thing that you can do that have the know-how of making sure that using materials that are um, far away from herbicides and pesticides that are killing our insect world and and one of the the um, one of the problems that we have with biodiversity. So I really make sure that we're choosing ingredients that are last longing of high quality with a low impact in the world, and then that added a sense of design that that hopefully you want to wear it the rest of your life. That's how I think about objects and pieces. Yes. Why do you think that sustainability is so important to you? I, I think that for me, sustainability is, is, like, is the most important thing that for any, everyone right now, it's, it's, like, it's like saying, is survival important to you? I mean, um, I don't know if you're in New York right now, Yes. but you saw yesterday, I mean, the air, um, I, it frightens me, right? The, 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 the fires that are 2,000 miles away um, 
it's that's the whole point where I try to explain with the work where it's we're an ecosystem. It's going to affect us all, and I learned it really um, in an intensive way when I was in Africa in, in the drought in 2017 of what climate injustice is, and and what concerns me the most right now is that everything that's been predicted by scientists, all the warning signs are everything happened with precision and a little bit faster than we expected on certain areas. But the moment is absolutely now. I think here's where we have the opportunity to really turn. This is the decade that, that by all means, by all scientists is the decade that we really commit to the change and and we can do it i i i you know i grew up in south america as, as we've mentioned and the ozone layer was very thin in that part of the world and i had developed skin cancer at a very young age at 26 years old um the basal cell ones and i remember there was a whole it was a big thing where when scientists realized that the ozone layer was thin and there was a huge commitment by the global community in order to to answer to 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 this issue and i feel that this is we haven't been here listening to the scientists for a long time and i think right now we are all experiencing in the developing world in the in the in the developed world is affecting us all we cannot just say this is someone else's problem anymore so i think that it's all, all all the strength is is pointing right now to to action to right now is going to be the moment of action in these next uh, few years yes um what is this on the wall over the sofa in this slide this is very interesting this is um my husband's uh phoebe apperson hearst um blanket that she quilted herself so it's in the store and it has all these um, uh, all these uh, basically leftover fabrics that she hand did and it's repurposed obviously and it has a herringbone pattern which is something that we use in our collection but it has such beauty and I've always thought it was the first thing to put in the in the store and um, it's quite beautiful. Yes let's look at the next one too because the next picture also That is uh, our store in London, yes. which is made with the with Norman Foster, which is one of the pioneers of architectural design. And this has so many elements. This picture, you have the floors that are actually old barrack floors from the Second World War in the Harry Moon pattern. All the furniture that you see there are um, it's London pine trees that that uh, got uh, fallen by in the in a storm and you can see that the furniture is all curved and it follows the curve of it's a beautiful beautiful store that's the basement of the of the of the store that we also made it as a sitting area and an environment where we can have hopefully uh, soon again events to sit down and talks yes lovely so this is not your typical hangers. <laughs> no, this is something that I'm really proud of. It's a commitment that we did in 2018 to get rid of plastic hangers in our, in our uh, production because 99% of the plastic hangers end up in, um, in uh, landfills and these are recycled carbon hangers. And one thing that's an interesting fact, America is very good at recycling cardboard. It's one of the things that we're very good at recycling. So these are actually the first version. These hangers have evolved. Uh, we've had like different iterations, but it really makes me proud because we had to push um, some of our retail partners to understand that even if it didn't match their vendor manual, this was the way that we needed to move forward. So uh, there was a lot of commitment to the cause on this in this achievement. This is very cool. Let's look at the next one because that you this is really um, effective what you're doing. This is um, the a biodegradable compostable um, garment bag, and we started with this. We developed from scratch with Tifa, and 
Um, now I am working as well for Chloe um, and in Chloe they have bigger teams. So when we brought them the materials, I was so happy to, for them to answer to the fact that this was the best in the market for, 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 this, um, for this purpose. And the garment bags were done by scratch. So now other designers can do it. So all the development that we have done is open for other people to use, which makes you very proud because the impact that you have as a small luxury brand, it, it's, it's lower compared to, to bigger brands. This is marvelous. And this is in use. Yes, this has been in use for a couple of years already. We were quite pioneers on this. And um, the inside is the Lauren sweater, which is hand knitted by Manos de Uruguay, which is a non for profit in Uruguay. So in this photo, you're seeing two things that matter um, the social impact and the environmental impact of a product. This is really beautiful and inspiring. Let's see the next one. Talk to me a little bit about uh, your style and about you know, how it's developed, some of the clothes that you're proudest of designing. Tell us about this collection, Spring Summer 2021. This is a beautiful, beautiful collection. I am really proud of this collection, especially because um, it was shown in Paris. We designed it during COVID. We did three collections during COVID. We never stopped. And we managed to create something with a lot of hope. And in this collection in specifically, the idea was that we were looking at the entrails of the pandemic. And there was a lot of subconscious work. There was a lot of dreams and there was a lot of um, the subconscious speaking through the collection. And I'm extremely proud of this because it was, it really was a joy. It's beautiful. And you see so many here too, you see the two components that you see the, the dress with the tassels, that is dead stock cashmere. Yes. The tassels are made all by hand. Then the, the runa sort of poncho in the, in the coat that you see, it's made by a non-for-profit in Bolivia with recycled cashmere. And then the, all, all the, the beading and the handwork that it, it has the, the dress underneath. So you have both the sustainability and the social impact again addressed in, in this. And, and and the result is clothes that you want to keep forever that are really yeah. precious. Oh yes, I, it really, you know, my mom, which is said to me recently, a compliment that I, I know what she meant and it was, in, and we are not come from a family that give each other too many compliments. I just want to FYI that. <laughs> and, and she said to me, you're, cause she was looking about different clothing and she said what I love about the pieces that you you do with your team is the fact that they look they feel like real they feel authentic yeah. and they, they are real clothes beautiful I love this next image is this an inspiration board yes this is this is so there's a few things going on here there's kill the girl virgin in the first one which was a, the, the inspiration for the fall 2021 collection. And she was very much, how can I explain? The, she was a, a nun on the middle ages that if she was born a man, we would know her like we would know Leonardo da Vinci. She was a polymath, new languages, new medicine, new art, and had this vision. So that's one of her visions of the world and she was an ecologist, an environmentalist in the middle ages. And then the, in the next picture is PV Apperson Hearst. I love those sleeves. Yeah. And then there is um, Mia Farrow next to flowers that were drawn by my daughter, Mia. Oh. They, and those flowers became the print of the collection. Beautiful. Oh, here they are, here are the flowers. Yeah. Yeah, they're crocheted here, they became 3D. And then you have the herringbone pattern. And you can see this kind of um, severe, no, I wouldn't say severe, but this more restrained, non sort of uh, look. Uh, that's, and you see the herringbone. It's very elegant. It's very cool, restrained. I love that trench. And I love Palo. Yeah. <laughs> 
it's such a good trench. Um, that one also is one, is one of those ideas that come from like a part of my brain. They just show up and I obsess with a sleeve. I have a lot of sleeves ideas. I, you know, they sleeves just come to my head. Yeah. I'm working on a sleeve now. It's a kind of a strange thing, but it's kind of, I just see the sleeve. Sleeves are a really important way to get an aesthetic across in a way that's wearable and, and, and natural. Yes, it's true. <clears throat> Charles James was very good at, well, Charles James was good at everything, but yeah. his leaves. My mother-in-law, my husband's wife was a patron of Charles James. I think she, she did a lot of work Austin hers for, for FIT yes. as well. Yes. <laughs> and all these sleeves, um, it's beautiful to see pictures of her with all these, these interesting sleeves as well. This is the Chapman bag, which is two things. It's a doctor's bag with a secret compartment and then a tote with silk macrame. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's what we would commonly refer to as a twofer. Yes, <laughs> yes. And then she's, wearing, then she's wearing a knit wool silk dress and, um, and leather pants underneath. Beautiful. Oh, that's you got all the you got them all good. Um, <laughs> so this is the our resort collection. So I was very uh, I had this obsession about creating these landscape sweaters that would speak certain key places on the Americas, North, South, and Central. And this one is Central America, and it's the Temple of Tetata Clan. Oh. This collection was inspired by the Hippitecas, which were the followers of the movement La Movida, the cultural movement in the late 60s. And then you have the skirt we recycle cashmere. You have the boots that a lot of our boots have this EVA recycled sole. And then the next outfit is actual a lace that we custom made with the walls of the Mayan temples of the ruins. So it actually has this sacred geometry that we replicated in the lace. Beautiful. And the belt buckle also is really organic and lovely. And the, and the cashmere is dead stock cashmere on that skirt. Another reason to love it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Um, I, that's the Mabel, which is a really uh, an engineering feast, the way this um, uh, crossover little bag, you can put your cell phone in it, you can put your credit card. It's really this sort of object from another era in a way that fits the modern style. Because the way it opens and the way it closes, it has a type of craftsmanship that is very rare to see today in in uh, in, uh, in handbags or or leather good pieces. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it has the functionality of the modern day. And then the next piece is all hand crochet recycled cashmere that is a tank top with a skirt, and the skirt itself, the fabric of the skirt, is a dead stock um, uh, cotton. And I wonder, you just have mentioned before how you put together three collections during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how your life has changed since the pandemic hit New York and, and what were the challenges of creating fashion during that long, long year? Well, I think the first one was that we couldn't be together, but we managed to work um, and I mean, it's always amazing to see human um, ingenuity at work in finding ways. And this is where creative people have so much admiration because I think creativity is what is a problem solving tool above all. And so you find a way. And and it was uh, it was a um, it was an episode. I've always had. I've been more scared, to be honest, about, I, I am more scared about the climate crisis than, than COVID because I knew we would overcome COVID. But what COVID has gave me hope was that we were able to change our habits really quickly. So I think we, we are gonna be, we can, we're able, now we know that we can change our habits very quickly 
in order to succeed in, 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 in the climate crisis, which, you know, is a mantra I repeat myself every day, climate success, climate success. But it's really the fact that we have to change the way we think and the way we act. And what COVID was a, a time of, of um, a lot of uh, recalibration, I would say. But and also the, the, the experience that we went globally. One is one of those rare times that globally we experience something. And as the same as the climate crisis, we need to all get out of it together. It's yeah. not going to work if it's, you know, it's still COVID in one part of the world and not another. So it's something that we still need to do together as, um, as, a, as, a, as a species. Yeah. And so um, it was, I would say it were they were challenging, interesting, growing times. Yeah, I hope you're right that people can uh, can continue to try and work together and change things. I just remember, I'm so old, I remember the first Earth Day and you think, wow, we wasted half yeah. a century. We really yeah. have to act now. Yeah, 50 years. Yeah. And everything that's been predicted from the first um, Earth Day to now has occurred to extreme accuracy. And I think that as I, I really, I am a true believer that the moment is now and the destruction that we have already occur um, has happened, but there is hope that we can still create, um, there's a regeneration power that our environment has that, you know, if it's going to be about a fight with the trees, the trees will win nature is extremely forceful. And this is something that I know as a, as a living in a ranch, I've seen, you know, thunder and I breaking out a, a house. I've seen the powerful, the power of nature, the magnitude and, and you see it now. And I think that, that that's why it's the call for action is, is as we speak. And I think that that a lot of people has woken up to it. I, I really think people were just saying, oh, we're all going to go back to the same habits. I'm like, no, some people woke up to it. Maybe some will go back to the same habits, but I think others are, are connected to the collective. So in terms of fashion, you think it's partly people should buy less and better things. They should travel less or less thoughtlessly. I think it's one of the, so I, I've, I've kind of done this, this little graph to explain um, in a in a in a instructive way that it can be assimilated, um, it's it's a circular. So one of the first things that we need to do for all industries, not only fashion, is decarbonize, right? Yeah. Reduce our our addiction and dependency to fossil fuels, because people forget that fossil fuels are just dead organism from another geological epoch that we extract from this earth, right? We push them down to, we push, we burn them and we push them through the atmosphere that has um, been warming up as well. And that, and that what we found out recently was that, that the oceans have been, um, have been trapping all the heat. So yeah. if it wasn't for the oceans, we already surpassed the 1.5 Celsius that it's, it's really, we cannot go through that breaking point because after that we have just lost all type of um, predictability to climate. And then then they have acid, then the oceans also get the acidification process. So fossil fuels is the number one thing that we need to move super fast. Um, there obviously there's some blocks that already have this uh, as a deadline. Europe is, is looking at 2035 to do the last car that is um, uh, oil dependent. And then you have the component, so you have fossil fuels, then you have the po uh, component of overproduction and overconsumption. So that they are connected, right? So if we overproduce, we over we push the overconsumption. So and here is a matter of waste management. Waste management is one of the main things we can do for conservation, which is a lot of the work that needs to be done. Thirty percent can be just done by conservation, and and so what happens when if you think about waste and design, there's no waste in nature. So for sure, buying consciously, you know, buying um, not in like how crazy had become in the past few decades. I wasn't brought up with this buying craziness. I, I only experienced it 
uh, as an as an adult in in um, living in in in, uh, in New York, but it's just something that I think that we need to think about. Why do we need this? Do we buy in excess? Like, like really think about it, right? Be conscious about what you consume. And then to that, the rehabilitation and conservation of our, our water, our biodiversity, our nutrients. So they all go connected. So removing ourselves from fossil fuel addiction, waste management, understanding, and then conservation. I understand that. Well, let's look at the next picture. Um, this is Diana Bag, by the way. Oh, yes, that, yes, which is such a cool one. Yeah, that's the Diana Bag, and it's really, um, it's a beautiful bag. And then here you have the Nina and Demis in different shapes and materials. And you have a, a the Beavers Bag, which is named after a friend of mine, which is a designer, Stuart Beavers. He designs uh, for Coach, and he's married to one of my best friends. And the, I made that bag for him. It's the, one of the few bags that has a, a male uh, name. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the crochet cashmere, cashmere tote bag that goes across. Fabulous. And the next one? Oh, that's, oh you really pick up good ones, huh? Um, <laughs> so these are, my, these are my rings. These are the rings that we do at GH. I, for a long time, people said to me I should do jewelry. And I finally did it in a way that I, I, I was looking at a painting in the Prado Museum and they had these rings. Um, is the presentation of, of the Christ, the, the painting by Quentin Massé. And they had all these, these men were wearing all these rings. So this is in fire by, by men's rings. And they are howlite, lapis lazuli, and malachi, and tigerite on, on gold. So there's something, again, this is our first pieces of jewelry, but there's something very timeless about it. Mm -hmm. T tell me, do you think, how has your designing career changed over the years? I mean, how has it developed your aesthetic? I think that my aesthetic is quite constant, I would say. It's just evolving. And as I learn and I, and I, and I um, understand more and I, and I educate myself um, with the subjects that I study, obviously that Im implements it but in the in the raw base of it it's quite constant like mm -hmm. i somebody sent me a picture of me dressed uh, at 16 years old and i was like i would wear that today uh -huh. you know so yeah. there's something very constant about it it's just more about you know techniques or learning about certain things that i want to learn how to craft or or it's more about right now we're really experimenting with vegetable dyes because I think it's a really interesting way that why do we we used to vegetable dye our clothing for so for so many centuries and so for millennia actually and so I think that that this is something that I would say the base has not evolved because it's like the seed is the constant but the technicality and the craft hopefully got improved <laughs> yeah. and uh, but I think that the main change, I would say, it's, it's how much purpose there is into me doing this work. Like what really keeps me going is, is, um, is really figuring out a way that we can do business and we can create with a lower impact to our environment. It's really an important goal. It's really yeah. crucial. I think that more and more of us in fashion realize that. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm really like it's like a, it's kind of really great. Um, so this one, I made this sweater when I competed in the Walmart price, and it's it's the rum ovaries, yeah. and it was like I was I kept on looking at pictures of ovaries because it's it was the new administration camp came in and there was threats on planet um, on on uh, Planned Parenthood and uh, Cecile Richards was the Head at the time, I had huge admiration, and and so I made this sweater to give me strength when I I competed in the Walmart. But at the same time, when I was being judged in the panel, uh, Victoria Beckham told me that's a really good sweater. She told you know because it's also it was about wool, right? Yeah. The the Walmart price, and she said you should make it. 
And so I said, you know what? You're, you're right, because she was one of the judges. And so she, so we did it, but with a partnership with Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. Can you still acquire it? Is it still available? Things are kind of done with them. We didn't do that many. Yeah. Wow. Oh, this wow. is a lady. Tell us, tell us about this. How did this come about? Oh my God. So, I mean, obviously it's a dream, right? That your outfit is worn in the inauguration day, but especially in this election. Yeah. And there was so much meaning into doing this outfit because it's dead stock cashmere embroidered in a garment district. Everything is made in the US and it has a sophistication that you can, you know, rivals to nothing to the Paris Maisons. Yeah. And so it's practically couture, it's couture. Yeah. And, and for me, even got more meaning after, because of course we were doing this, this, we knew before the riots, the capital riots that we were doing this outfit. And the fact that the riots happened and we were doing this outfit, it was so important for us to be part of, of in a little way on this big moment that showed that America can do sophistication, that that was not really what America was, that that didn't really represent us, who we were. And so, so it was a way of, of being able to say how we are a sophisticated country that's full of people from all over the world. And Joe Biden is an educator. And, and for, for me, and from all the research and everyone agree that education is the key to solve a lot of the things that took us to the capital. So um, to that, to that moment. So I think that there's so much symbolism and so much hope to in this outfit for me, because I have high hopes for her as a, for a first lady, because she's a teacher. Yes. Yeah, it's so beautiful. The symbolism of the flowers and the kind of yeah. rebirth and, and the natural world is really perfect. It's such a magical. It's magical each power of, uh, of every state of the United States because unity is one of the key tools that we need to get out of any crisis. Any crisis, any crisis, any shape, any scale, you need unity to get out. Yeah, very true. Uh, now, you've also <laughs> recently started designing for Chloe. Yes. So I wanted to ask you, how did it come about and how is your eponymous business different from the designs you do for Chloe? So the this is, I mean, Chloe, to design for Chloe was always a dream and, and um, to be able to scale up all the lessons we learned in, uh, in research and development on sustainability at Gavrila Hearst gave her an opportunity to be able to put those in practice on a larger scale and then have, because there's more manpower to be able to account these efforts and to be able to show progress to the plan. And so it gives, it's, it's, um, from aesthetic point of view, I differentiate them from Chloe being Aphrodite and Gabriela Hurst being Athena. And there is a point where they both mix, right? In the sense of, of um, value system, um, belief system, making sure that, that the materiality has a low impact to the environment and all those things that matter to me uh, personally, obviously, they are going to be reflected in both places. But um, I think that there's a different sort of um, softness to the uh, Chloe uh, woman, and I, but not lacking of strength. I think that it's just um, it's just another way of doing product, and also you're working with different teams, so I, it, it, it's going to be different. It's going to turn out into a different. Um, uh, type of product, but also what Gorilla Hearst has, which is a much smaller brand, and we have a very light team, 
everything is able to, we can work with the best materials in the world because we have a very light structure. So yeah. that's a very different, um, it's more, I would say Gabriela Hearst has less industrialization. Yeah. Now, uh -huh. if you were not a designer, what would you be doing? Right now, I think I would be 100% devoted to do anything possible to uh, um, work with climate change and climate injustice. And I believe that this is why I'm a designer because it's kind of what I have some sort of talent for and some sort of um, people resonate to it. So it comes in a natural world. So this is natural way. So this is my medium. So I think through my medium, I'm able to do also the work that drives me. Yeah. And finally, with just the last image, um, I'm wondering what, what, if any impact do you think it has on your work that you're a woman? Everything. I, 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 I'm feeling very, um, I feel like it's so good to see all these because they like keep moments that you choose on these photos i'm really touched really um i wasn't expecting this it's this is our showroom in paris and i really had this um we had to have a place in paris to show our collections and i didn't understand why other designers didn't rent a full place because it was so much economical than just renting it for the key places of market now i know because it was a pain in the ass to rent something in paris yes. you have to like sign a lot of documents but thank God we have French people with us. So we navigated from the bureaucracy. But this place has the herringbone wood, the, the, the Manos cashmere. And it was a great moment of uh, knowing that you have your own spot in Paris. It made you feel more of a global brand. Thank you so much for giving this interview. It's really, I think, going to be so important for the whole audience for the museum at FIT. We've got a lot of students and young designers and people who I think will really be moved and motivated um, by what you had to say. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been very, very inspiring and, and emotional to, to be able to, to reflect on, because sometimes you're doing the things and you're not really reflecting on it. But, it, but I think that I would say to young students, the world is yours at this point. We're just guardians to trying to make sure that it's not completely <laughs> screwed up. But I can't take, I can't wait till you guys take over and um, because the world is going to be a much better place. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao.